everyone. Welcome to Lex Talk, World Talk Show presented by Clickaway Creators. Today we have Harsh Bhagirat Bush with us. Enrolled on the rolls of the Bar Council of India through the Regional Council of Maharashtra and Goa, Harsh's practice areas are commercial and corporate litigation, admiralty and trade laws, dispute resolution, constitutional law, technology media, and telecommunications, including white collar crimes too. His primary forum of practice is Bombay High Court and Supreme Court of India, but appears across courts and tribunals across India. With vision set for preparing for the future of the legal industry, he's one of the few lawyers in India engaged in international space law, both on the advisory and dispute resolution fronts. Personally, Harsh is passionate about traveling, reading, blogging, and photography. He's a regular speaker at academic institutions and law schools as well. He asserts his belief that if nobility was ever defined by a profession, it would be academics. He's currently pursuing his visions with MZM Legal India. Without any further ado, let me just introduce you to Harsh. Hello, Harsh. How are you? Hi, Bharti. I'm doing well. Thank you for the generous introduction. It's absolutely a pleasure having you here, uh, Harsh. Uh, please uh, brief us about your journey as a legal professional. So uh, my legal journey, uh, my legal journey has been very interesting. I, I am a first generation lawyer in my family. Uh, my family was not too enticed with uh, the idea of me pursuing law because it, we are a family of doctors and uh, uh, my father is a merchant navy captain still sailing. So he was always of the opinion that I should follow his steps. But somehow, somewhere it was this... Uh, spark in the dark, I always call it when I'm discussing, that I wanted to do something that was going to serve the society. And I was headstrong right from school, somehow made it through law school, fighting with my parents, and then proved it to them that yes, I, I can make a lawyer of myself. I got into a uh, international reputed law firm called ALMT Legal and uh, began my practice as an associate. Uh, thereafter, I moved out independent after three years of my association with ALMT Legal. I moved out independent because I wanted to uh, evaluate and explore myself as a lawyer, independently taking on matters, arguing them, giving out independent advice, not supervised, trying to see if I'm doing the right thing. At the same time, I always felt that being in a law firm uh, was going to curtail the reason why I have taken up law. My reason, the core reason at my heart today also remains. I want to educate people about the rights that they have. Uh, people who have been victimized to different kind of uh, suppressions and oppressions, uh, uh, ladies who are uh, afflicted with uh, domestic violence, economic violence, a lot of underprivileged people who are who who are being thrown away to the corners of the world need legal assistance and are unable to uh, obtain quality legal assistance because of the costs being too high or just because they cannot approach. So I'm trying to educate, my aim is to educate people about their rights, their responsibilities. And it's not just on the talk, uh, you know, it's at, at the talk that I'm saying it. I try and educate. Uh, that's why if you see, I've uh, made it a point that I always speak at law schools, speak at schools itself, undergraduate uh, uh, and higher level sec secondary schools where it's at the root level. So I moved out independent because I could then concentrate on that as well. Uh, two and a half years of my independent practice gave me exposure to a lot of law schools, to a lot of students of different strata of life. I have uh, approached a lot of uh, not-for-profit not organizations, NGOs, to associate with them, to educate people, help them out, assist them in various kinds of uh, legal assistance in their needs for the life and at the same time uh, kept the commercial aspect in my practice alive 
uh, made sure that I take up uh, high profile matters, high stake matters, uh, interact with uh, multinational companies. Uh, in fact, one of these interactions led me to the newest avenue of law that I've taken on international space laws. That has given me uh, a new view to commercial aspect uh, internationally. So in all, it's been, it's been a very varying sphere of journey, but uh, throughout the single point focus has been uh, awareness and education. Yes, as a lawyer today, if someone approaches me, I will quote them fees for assisting them or solving their issues. But at the same time, I will see that the genuinity, if that person says that they cannot afford fees, I will see that genuinely are they in trouble Genuinely, they cannot afford the fees. I have waived out my fees for a lot of people. So yes, my journey has and continues to be uh, awareness with commercial commercializing whatever I can out of it. But uh, at the same time, not, not letting go the nobility that the profession had from its origins many, many years ago. Well, uh, you have left me uh, speechless uh, after you. knowing your journey. I mean, I'm sure many people are going to get re like really inspired and they should, you know, people should just uh, get inspired from people like you. That, that, that's, that's what I feel right now after hearing uh, your journey out. Um, you just, uh, you know, uh, you have told us that how did you get into uh, law and what exactly were you thinking? But was there a specific reason uh, for choosing law? Like, apart from trying to do, you know, you're trying to do something different from your uh, parents, but what drove you? Uh, what drove me particularly into law was... Uh... I, I like the analysis aspect that goes into application of law into various aspects. I like giving each aspect a different vantage point, uh, a different view. I'm open to opinion. Since I call myself an anthropologist, a people's pe person, I like to interact with people to know their opinions about different kinds of things. And then how those would affect my analysis of a certain problem or a certain issue at hand. And I believe I've been like that since quite a young age. And somehow at some point in time, I must have recognized that and decided that it's one of the two places that I could uh, use it was A, uh, try and get into the bureaucratic side of the government by giving the civil services examination and B was getting into law school. Back when I was commencing uh, law, I was scared that, you know, I might not just make the cut into the civil services examination and I never attempted. I regret it till date. I regret it till date, but be that as may, I decided to take on law. Like I said, I love reading. The volume never, voluminous reading never scared me. And it just intrigued me more and more. I was always a uh, fan of John Grisham, uh, who loves to write about law, P.G. Woodhouse. I, I read all of them. So that just kept the fire alive. And uh, I decided one day that, look, this is a profession. I mean, once when you're connected to a profession, you like to research about it. You, you would see stalwarts uh, being recognized, being uh, accoladed for their practice in law and it garners a respect. I've seen over time that this profession garners some kind of respect and it offers you to hold some kind of special dignity apart from yourself that you know in a, in a group of people when you go and introduce yourself that you're a lawyer uh, you know it may be the biggest inter industrialists or the biggest doctors all of them will raise an eyebrow and say oh all right you're a lawyer that sort of still gives me a kick even today. I mean, despite me being a lawyer for so many years, it still gives me a kick when I introduce myself that, yeah, I'm a lawyer. 
Wow, I, I wish that everybody talks about their profession as passionately as you do. <laughs> uh, now, on a, on a very lighter note, I am very much interested uh, in, in this question. Uh, what is your most memorable case? Like what has been your most memorable case so far? And if you have any key takeaways from that? My most memorable case, uh, the first answer that comes is a, is a very recent case of uh, 25 crew members of uh, Philippine nationality uh, on a vessel called uh, Evangelia, which was abandoned uh, off the coast of Andhra Pradesh about two years ago by the owners of the vessel. And they were not giving any kind of assistance in terms of wages, food, provision, not even enough fuel to run the ship so that, you know, it doesn't sink or get run aground or something like that. And uh, I was contacted by a couple of gentlemen from the International uh, Seafarers Organization. And uh, they said that, look, the Philippine government is looking at some, uh, appointing a lawyer who's going to, you know, uh, try and resolve this issue for the, for the crew members. The crew has been trying to contact the government and has gotten only this far as, you know, letting, know that, letting the government know that they've been abandoned. So I took it up. I said on a human front, let's do this. I, I told the government that I, I, there are certain commercials that will be involved because it will take me to travel from my uh, native practice area in Bombay to Andhra Pradesh. But uh, I'll take it on. And I did take it. Uh, the day I got the release order for them that they could get off the vessel and their travel is going to be paid for and they'd be taken back home to their country, that gave me some kind of satisfaction. And that satisfaction further crystallized when I met these 25 gentlemen at the airport. And they were literally thanking me. Some of them even came up and, you know, hugged me tightly saying, you know, if it wasn't for you, we, I don't, we don't know where we be. There'll be a lot of lawyers who must have done this. I'm not denying that. This is one of very regular cases, but these are the, these are the gems in each string that I would like to, you know, hold that these are memories that they have thanked me for the service that I've done for them. I got my uh, commercial aspect, which I had discussed with the government. I even got a letter of appreciation from the Philippines government. But what, what did bring a peaceful nap that night was the family was united. Fathers met their daughters, husbands met their wife, sons met their parents. That, that's something that really holds memory to me. This is, this is off. This is about two years ago. It, it continues to be a memorable one. Uh, because of the emotions that got attached uh, unintendedly and just in a, within a short uh, span of about a couple of weeks. Till date, I hold that case very close to me. Uh, the gentlemen in India who approached me, uh, they have got they have formed themselves into a advisory board, which look after these kind of seafarers, and they've happily offered me a position on their advisory board as a, as a legal advisor that has further crystallized the memories that, you know, one, one act of acceptance of this kind of an assignment has led to so, so much of growth, even in my legal career. Wow. I thought that it is going to be like, you know, a funny one or something like that, but even after two years, uh, you have gotten like really intense. So I, I'm, I, I can feel you. I mean, I might not be able to uh, understand, uh, you know, that well, what exactly, how you must have felt, but I, I can at least try and, uh, wow, that, that's just amazing. There's one that's another the thing, feeling. actually. It's not a case, but it's, it's a time when I was speaking in, in a law school and uh, the... Uh, the organizers had uh, put out the introduction on on placards everywhere you know who was the guest speaker and i spoke for about 20 minutes it was it was a pre-prepared 
uh, speech on certain aspects of constitutional law. But I spoke to an audience of about 230 students. I remember answering about 100 of them on only one aspect. What is international space law? Where can we study it? How do we do it? How did you study it? How do you get work? What kind of work do you get to go to space? I mean, the interest that just those three lines, th those three words had generated was humongous. I mean, it, I had not even spoken about that subject of law. But just people had read it on the, on, on, on the introduction sheet and they only waited for 20 minutes patiently out of whatever I had to say in my lecture to ask these questions. No one asked me about what I had said in the 20 minutes. Well, would you like to talk about that uh, here? Because I'm sure if, uh, you know, people were interested then, I'm, I'm sure people would uh, want to yeah. talk about it. International space law, international space law is something, it's, it's an infant today. Even in the international sphere, it's an absolute infant today. And... Uh, the, we, the, the countries are getting together, creating their own domestic legislations on how space should be, uh, space program should be developed and grown in their own countries. But at the same time, no one is, no one is thinking about the international relations that are going to be up in the black sphere. And it's, it's very interesting. There are, there are treaties like how we have here, uh, there are treaties about the world over, but you know it's just it's just very interesting. Uh, you can start from studying about it right in our own country in India, and then there are several several universities that give a master's in space law. And uh, but the only thing is, after you become a space lawyer. What is going to happen is you're going to start looking for work. Now, work is only going to come if you are affiliated to a government as a lawyer, uh, as, as a legal advisor. Otherwise, in private, uh, private spaces, some countries have opened up their space program to private individuals uh, like a, a SpaceX, Elon Musk, China, for that matter. India has now in the current Atmanirbhar package opened about 50% of the uh, space program to private individuals, but the amount of uh, liability that can come on is so huge that very few people are going to take it on. But that's that's like I said, it's an infant. You you we are going to see it grow into a smashing uh, individualistic uh, form of law. I, I mean, I can only imagine, and uh, like we say, imagination. There is no limit to an imagination. So well, actually, can... that was, uh, uh, you know, my next question that uh, your two of your practice areas, uh, which are uh, Admiralty and International Space Laws, they're relatively, you know, a niche practices in India. So how do you see them growing in coming years? So before you dive deeper into it, let's just talk about, you know, everything as a whole. Yeah. So, uh... What admiralty laws are a specific form of transportational laws. Today, looking at the various time essence uh, understanding that people have, you know, that the faster we get things, the better it is. Quality matters, quicker it is, it is more premium. Uh, there are only two ways that you can achieve maximum transport. That is either by air or through the sea. And India is one of the largest coastlines uh, in, in, in the world. Commercially, it is so, so active. Uh, about seven and a half to 8,000 kilometers of a coastline is no joke. And it's in, the, it's in the prime center of the world. I mean, yeah, you, you do say the world is round, but if you see it's equidistant from the west, it's equidistant from the east. And... We, we are opening up our markets to, uh, you know, different kind of uh, arrangements, different kind of agreements, different kind of investment avenues where commercially it can be exploited so much that 
in the next few years admiralty law is going to change earlier it used to be very uh, seafarer specific or ship as a commodity specific but today it's got diversified into wet maritime laws dry maritime laws you have certain laws that apply on land despite they are meant for the sea and vice versa you have certain land uh, certain laws that apply on land as well as on a vessel when it's on sea the the vast vastness of this uh, aspect of law is only increasing yes at some point of time you will say that uh, this has been uh, this has been an ancient form of traveling right since vasco da gama columbus the only way of traveling was the sea route but you the very fact that it's been since columbus till me today uh, which you know, differences us about 2 2000 years or so uh, sorry 200 years or 300 years or so establishes the fact that this is a form of industry that is evolving itself to blend into the current scenario and like like i said for example take take uh, for example the pandemic world over everything stood still but the merchant community the admiralty the shipping agencies the ships the seafarers uh, work all over of cargo didn't stop so that's that's going to be a lifeline and i see i see this uh, in the next couple of years becoming one of the stronger uh, more stronger arms of law where the laws are going to evolve faster and uh, it's going to become more competitive more interesting newer laws are going to come in force safety is going to become more stri- uh, strict yes so i mean talking in terms of admiralty is that in terms of international space law like i said uh, it's 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 a it's a baby its first birthday in my understanding was celebrated when india opened up its space program partially to uh, private entities it will be so interesting to see someone creating a rocket uh, a spacecraft in india the laws that will be around the such kind of construction the laws that are who will lease it who will buy it who can sell it who can store it where do you store it what are the reasons to store it how do you store it all of these are, things are going to involve advising on legal situations beyond that it is going to require a legal presence or a legal mind to see the fact that everything is in the interest of equity and justice you cannot make a situation where one person is uh, benefiting out of it and the other person is getting derailed or you know uh, railroaded because of someone's benefit so all of this is going to require a lot of legislation a lot of compliance and a lot of law so the next 5 7 years uh is going to be booming is going to be booming for the two industries from a niche practice it's going to become a nice practice <laughs> all right thank you thank you so much uh, harsh uh, for sharing uh, your knowledge and experience with us uh, in terms of your practice areas as well uh, now 2020 has been a crazy year for all of us in a good way bad way whatever we want to call that uh but how much of the pandemic has restructured the legal profession in india as per you i mean what's your yeah. take on it and if you have any learnings or any key takeaways from the pandemic and the change in the legal profession the legal profession has changed big time it i mean virtual courts used to be used to be in those comic strips that you would read galactica etc etc kind of a dream and yeah and blink of the eye you have you are in three courtrooms at the same time one laptop second laptop third laptop you are in three courtrooms at the same time you're being muted by a judge because he doesn't want to hear you <laughs> no matter no matter how much you yell he's just going to press a button and he's going to tell you to shut up and there's nothing you can do and that has happened that has happened so many times you know we there are there are some incessant lawyers who think that constant 
uh, howling or constant screeching or constantly talking on on the screen in a loud voice is going to uh, get them their reliefs but the judge very candidly will only do this not just telling them that they've been muted but telling the whole world who is on the screen that look this bugger was making so much of noise i muted him oh, wow. and imagine uh, they uh, let me bharti let me ask you have you been to a court room oh that's what no <laughs> oh, okay 2020 has brought in a situation where the court room comes to you if you have been if you have been a litigant at some point of time you will realize that the ease and the convenience that a virtual courtroom has brought into a lawyer and a litigant's life is is insane is insane and the legends at the bar both in the supreme court and the various high courts the judges have adapted to technology so quickly it's it's like they were made to fit like a puzzle virtual courts and lawyers and judges and judiciary were to fit like a puzzle but at the same time i am not a person who would propagate virtual courts i was actually coming to that you yeah. know yeah <laughs> i i i am not a person who would propagate virtual courts as much as it is good to achieve uh, a three appearance fee in the same place at the same time but it's not the same thrill it's not the same gut feeling that you get when you're standing in front of the bench and you uh, you're addressing across the bar the voice booms and the four corners of the walls that's that's a feeling that's that cannot be uh taken away that's 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 another feeling i mean given a chance i'd go physically argue the matter physically and uh, you know even if i'm not given the relief even my even if my matter is dismissed my my body knows that i have stood there for 2 hours i've taken the physical efforts i have prepared myself the night before reading thousands of papers my, making my notes and i've gone i've taken efforts in at the same time when you you are doing all of it when you're preparing before a virtual courtroom you're doing all of it but you're just not there you know it's just that just shy of that one bit and that one bit makes hell of a difference i i would for 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 the betterment of the future industry legal industry i would say that virtual courts should become streamlined and should come into play should be uh, more accessible people should be able to see it on youtube or there should be a channel that shows courtrooms on regular tv but the you know the heart the small lawyer in my heart says no no you need to go to court to make sure you get win your case but that's that's something that you need to get used to we all got used to 2020 well uh, thank you so much uh, harsh for answering that uh, question and uh, it has just gotten uh, intense uh, i mean now uh, i really want to go into a courtroom and see like how how does it all happen like you you've given me that kind of a feeling so uh, but uh, we have talked about your journey as an independent uh, lawyer individual legal practitioner but at the same time we actually want to know more about your roles and responsibilities uh, with the current organization that you're with that is mzm legal so it would be great if you can just throw light on that as well yeah so M- mzm legal has come in at a very uh, poignant time in my life uh i was becoming an independent practitioner taking up practice very well uh but uh, an opportunity came by where uh i would get to learn an entirely new aspect of law that's white collar crime mzm is mzm legal is tier 1 in india for white collar crime and is internationally recognized for their white collar crime practice so this was this was again a growing branch of law in the country and i really wanted to take the slice of the cake and at the same time mzm was is 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 uh, a new generation law firm that uh, you know likes to create leaders and likes to create uh, successful practitioners from within its within its own walls 
So, uh, Mr. Zulfikar Memon, uh, the managing and founding partner of MZM Legal, gave me a very uh, interesting role where I am responsible for a team of uh, lawyers. We co-work together into uh, different kind of uh, high-stake clients. At the same time, Mr. Zulfikar Memon gives us uh, responsibilities to solicit clients, to interact with them, to try and counsel them. And uh, he is not like your old school partners who'd want to supervise what is happening. Uh, his, his style is much different and gives some kind of a freedom to his uh, partners, other partners and association, associates. And uh, we get a chance to grow in that. So my role currently is I am I'm with them learning white collar crime, developing uh, a team look uh, part of being being a vital part of their commercial and dispute resolution team and at the same time we are all as a one as one family being there for each other and uh, it, it's it's more of the person that mr memon is that i like to take on this uh, responsibility and uh, this role with mzm rather than be individual because uh, I, I, I have gotten an opportunity to grow further. And uh, I mean, I can't thank him enough for this opportunity. And it's, it's again, become a part of my journey. So it's going to always be memorable. Well, Harsh, uh, trust me when I say this, you, you're, I mean, I should touch wood or something like that. Yeah, you're blessed with the best and uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, the best thing and why all of this is happening to you is because you are somebody who enjoys, you know, uh, your profession, you're really passionate about it. And I guess that is the reason that, uh, you know, you're blessed with the best. And uh, I mean, sadly, we have come to an end uh, of, of this conversation. Um, but thank you so much for sharing such great insights with us uh, and uh, you know sharing your knowledge experience and contributions uh, with our audience we really look forward to having a chat with you again in the future on some other trending topics in the international legal industry for sure and uh, for our viewers if you like this chat with harsh which i'm very sure that you would do please like and share this video and also subscribe to click away creators youtube channel to appreciate what we do and you have more coming from industry leaders. This is Bharti for Talk signing off.